In 1967, The Doors' Light My Fire had climbed to number one. The lyrics to the song have been inspired by the Rolling Stones' 1965 single, Play With Fire. Jim Morrison by this point had completely disowned his family. They had no idea he had a number one song or even that he was in a band. Jim's 18 year old brother Andy was sitting at home when one of his friends visited holding a copy of The Doors first album. He stated, isn't this Jim? Andy had been listening to Light My Fire for weeks yet never recognised it was his own brother singing. That night Andy played it for his parents and they heard Jim singing on record for the first time. Jim's mother Clara sat silently shocked but his father didn't even put down his newspaper. In his early years his parents had run the house with a military like discipline. One of the last times Jim had seen his father was three years previously in 1964 before leaving for LA. He'd had his hair cut to appease him, but it was still too long for George Morrison, so he was taken for a second trim. Not until later in his life would George even speak of his son's music. Over the next few days, Jim's mother tried to contact him. She started by phoning the record company the doors were signed to, Electra Records. Clara stated she was Jim Morrison's mother and after giving convincing evidence they gave her the number of a hotel Jim was staying in. When she finally spoke to him over the phone she told him how she wanted to hire a private detective to locate him but George had refused. She begged him to come home for Thanksgiving to which Jim who'd been grunting through the conversation replied, Uh, I think I'll be pretty busy then. Jim then countered with an offer for his family to come along to a Doors concert at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Clara responded, Jim, you know how your father is, will you get your hair cut before you come home? And that was the end of the conversation. Jim said goodbye, put the phone down and stated, I don't want to talk to her ever again. On the day of the concert, Clara arrived early in the afternoon with Jim's younger brother Andy. Jim's father had refused the invitation, though he had wrote him a letter telling him, give up any idea of singing or any connection with a music group because of what I consider to be a complete lack of talent in this direction. At the front desk, Clara overheard the Doors agent Todd Schiffman talking about the group. She introduced herself as Jim's mother and asked if she could see him. A messenger was sent to contact Jim and returned to Todd with Jim's response. Jim says, no way. Todd figured he could stall them until Jim changed his mind. So he took Clara and Andy to dinner and told them Jim would see them later that night. That night the two stood by the side of the stage and watched the doors perform. They were assured Jim would see them after the show. The Doors went through their set as normal and at one point Jim looked over at his mother with a vacant stare before turning away. After the concert Clara and Andy were taken to a hotel room where again they were reassured Jim would see them. Eventually all the stalling was through and Todd admitted Jim had left for the Ed Sullivan show. On September 17th, 1967, the door sat in the dressing room waiting to perform on the Ed Sullivan Show. They were approached by the show's director, who was also Ed Sullivan's son-in-law. He nervously told them, It's about your song, Light My Fire. You cannot say the word higher. We'll have to change the song. The group sat there in silence, looking puzzled, before Jim said, Sure. I think we can come up with another line. Ecstatic, the director called in Ed Sullivan and gave the good news. Jim noticed the host's son-in-law addressed him as Mr. Sullivan as they spoke. Ed then said to the group, You boys look great when you smile. Don't be so serious. And with that, the band took the stage. As expected, they ignored the request and sang the original lyrics. When the director heard the unchanged lyrics, he screamed, You're dead on this show, 
you'll never do this show again. Ed Sullivan was enraged and refused to shake hands with the band after the performance. Their next six performances booked with the show were cancelled. The Doors never played the Ed Sullivan show again. At a party not long after the Sullivan show, the artist Andy Warhol gave Jim an ivory and gold French telephone. As the two sat in a limousine with another friend, Jim threw the phone out of the window. By this point in his life, Morrison had become a furious drunk and cared very little about hiding it. Hey, what are all these people doing? Oh, I hate people. Alcohol was always his drug of choice. He didn't need to find a dealer and arrange times to meet to exchange goods, which he hated. He could walk into any bar or liquor store and it was available. It was uncomplicated and easily accessible. This suited Jim Morrison. He was known to often get paralytic drunk and throw bottles or chairs. He lived his life by the William Blake quote, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Jim romanticized alcohol. He saw himself like all the other drinking writers like Hemingway. The difference was alcohol never helped his work, only hindered it. The band worked around him and wouldn't dare criticize him to his face. They knew anyway, there was no stopping Jim. Later they would try to speak to him about his drinking, but it was futile. Jim had hated the front cover to The Doors' first self-titled album. For their second album, he refused to feature on it. The band had obtained an advanced copy of Sgt Pepper and flipped over it. It inspired them to experiment with new techniques. The album didn't sell as well as the previous effort. It was a great disappointment. Today it is looked back on as one of the band's greatest albums. The songs followed the Doors theme of lost alienated people. The music was more dark than the Beatles and more disturbing than the Rolling Stones. All the time brutally honest, but then Jim was more violent than John Lennon and more shocking than Keith Richards. Jim had written many of the lyrics to his songs two years previous. Jim would write the lyrics and the vocal melody and the band would fit the instruments around them. Around this time Jim would meet Janis Joplin, another wild child of excess destined to die at 27. According to American record producer Paul Rothschild, they met sober and were getting along great until they began drinking. When Jim drank he became obnoxious and violent. Joplin refused his advances and Jim grabbed her by the hair. At that point, she hit him over the head with a bottle of Southern Comfort and Jim was out cold. The next day, a friend spoke to Jim about the incident in a recording studio. He proclaimed, what a great woman. Jim had always loved violence. In December 1968, one day after Jim's 24th birthday, he was backstage with a girl when a cop ordered them off the premises. Jim and the cop began arguing as the girl ran away. It ended with Jim being sprayed with mace before staggering away shouting. A group quickly gathered around as he complained about being maced. The cop became nervous and rushed over helping the band's roadie wash Jim's face in a sink. He apologised before Jim walked away towards the stage. During the instrumental break of Backdoor Man, Jim began talking about the incident. He stated, I want to tell you about something that happened a few minutes ago. He went over the incident telling the audience he and the girl were standing backstage stating, we weren't doing anything, just talking. And then this little man came in there, this little man in a little blue suit and a little blue cap. Jim went on with the story quoting the cop saying, what you doing here? To which he replied, nothing. The police who were standing in front of the stage started to become very nervous. Jim went on to say, but he didn't go away. He stood there and reached from behind him and brought out this little black can of something. And then he sprayed it in my eyes. An enraged policeman then arrested Jim live on stage. 
He was later booked with indecent and immoral exhibition and resisting arrest. A few months later, Jim was charged with indecent exposure while performing live on stage. The problem was, the audience loved it, and the more crazy Jim acted, the more fans he gained. They would show up to Doors gigs just to see the crazy Jim Morrison. At these gigs, he would often encourage the crowd to riot. For their third album, Waiting for the Sun, there was no previous compositions. The problem was, Jim's alcoholism had steadily increased and with that his songwriting had stopped. They'd been able to fall back on early writings, enough to get through two albums, now they struggled to come up with the material. Many of the songs were created while in the recording studio and they were forced to use older, unused songs. It received mixed to negative reviews and did terrible commercially. The album did especially bad in the UK, failing to even chart. Jim at this point had abandoned his previous look. He grew a beard and gained weight. He wanted to distance himself from the Lizard King persona, yet his alcoholism was as bad as it ever had been. The band had been shocked by the critical response to their previous album. Morrison Hotel hoped to vindicate them. Jim's progressive drinking was documented in songs like Roadhouse Blues. The lyrics read, I woke up this morning and got myself a beer. The album was seen by many as a comeback and did very well commercially. Jim's life was a never ending roller coaster. He jumped out of moving cars just for the experience. He hung out of three story windows by his hands. He obsessed over a memory he had as a child seeing Native American Indians bleeding to death in the road. This incident featured in many of his songs and poetry. Jim spent nearly the entirety of his adult life with a woman named Pamela Corson. She encouraged him to write and attended his concerts in support. On September 20th, 1970, Jim was convicted of indecent exposure and found guilty after a 16-day trial. He was sentenced to six months in prison and had to pay a $500 fine. He never served the time, paying a 50000 bail bond. After the trial, work began on The Doors' final album, L.A. Woman. By this point, Jim had completely succumbed to alcoholism. It was understood by everyone in the group that after the album was complete, Jim was moving to Paris. He even left before all the songs had been mixed, stating, You guys can finish up. LA Woman was a massive success. The band's popularity soared. Rolling Stone called it The Doors' greatest album. While the band reached their pinnacle of success, Jim was now thousands of miles away from LA in an apartment in Paris. In an attempt to control his drinking, he switched from whiskey to white wine. He went on a diet and began to lose weight. Due to all the drinking and French food, he couldn't get back down to his ideal figure. He also shaved his beard in an attempt to look like the Jim Morrison of the mid-60s. Around this time, Jim made an effort to quit drinking cold turkey. He soon found he couldn't. After that, he began to fall back into his old ways. He found new drinking buddies and found that his old life in LA had followed him to Paris. In the following weeks, Jim began having coughing fits and fever-like symptoms. When a friend met him, he was drinking heavily and despite the hot temperature, was freezing cold. On July 3rd, 1971, Jim Morrison was found by Pam dead in the bathtub of their apartment at approximately 6am. Straight away, she called the emergency services. At first, they thought he was still alive because his body was warm. They soon realised this was only the heat from the bath water and he was pronounced dead. Morrison's death is surrounded in mystery as there was no autopsy performed due to French law at the time. Also, Pam never requested one. 
Many believe Jim died of a heroin overdose. The official cause was listed as heart failure. Jim's death came nine months after Joplin's. He'd been saddened by the news of her passing. The pair apparently made amends two weeks before her death. There have been numerous conspiracy theories over the years. Some speculate his death was due to an injury he suffered just before moving to Paris. He'd fallen two stories at the Chateau Montmont Hotel in Hollywood. The only thing that had saved his life was the roof of a shed which helped break his fall. Jim left his entire estate to Pam Coulson. Unfortunately, she died three years later from a heroin overdose. After her death, Jim Morrison's parents fought for and received half of Jim's estate. <laughs>